fact is, uh, 1941, the uh, battalion of engineers was training at Fort Knox. This is a battalion of engineers, five companies of uh, 200 men each, so it's approximately a thousand men, give or take a few. We trained at uh, Fort Knox in uh, road and bridge building, uh, road repair, and the whole battle of the 16th engineers is in this in this booklet here, and uh, also included there are photographs of 37 bridges that were built or replaced in, in Italy. The 1st Armored Division was uh, assigned to the Italian campaign and uh, there was a ridge of mountains that uh, came all the way down uh, from one end of Italy to the other. And uh, at one of the uh, division reunions, I picked up this uh, brochure of uh, 37 photographs of bridges that were, were built by this battalion of engineers. This is the history of the 1st Armored Division from its uh, inception in uh, Fort Knox in 1940 uh, up until uh, it was deactivated after uh, all they, they were still involved with the Persian Gulf War. So they, they have since been deactivated. And uh, to begin with, we were using outmoded tanks. We had the old Grant tank that uh, was nicknamed the Rots because you strike a match in it and go up in flames. And it was powered by gasoline and later models were diesel powered. But uh, the uh, Valentine's Day of, of 1943, the Battle of Kasserine Pass started. And uh, <coughs> we lost 150 tanks in uh, three days of, of uh, fighting at the opening of the Battle of Kasserine all the way back to, to uh, from Pai Pass where I was taken prisoner all the way to the Kasserine where they were able to stop the Germans turn around and finish up the job in North Africa. I was uh, taken prisoner along with General Patton's son-in-law, uh, Colonel John Waters was married to uh, Patton's daughter, and uh, Colonel Waters spent the whole time in, in uh, German prison camp. Well, he was in an officer camp, separate from mine. And uh, toward the latter part of the war, General Patton found out where his son-in-law was located, and he sent a small task force behind German lines to uh, liberate that prison camp. And uh, unfortunately, it was not enough of a force to protect itself. They were shot up and uh, all taken prisoner. And one of the prisoners that was liberated and the commander of that task force got together and wrote this narrative of uh, the 
dash back to the prison camp and and uh, they were not very complimentary to General Patton. He was uh, this was one of his better bad moments and uh, this, this is a very scathing book of, uh, of the operation. Did the son survive? I mean, the yes, son -in -law. he was he, his son-in-law. He uh, ended up uh, major general and commanded a uh, tank uh, division. After we had uh, participated in the Louisiana maneuvers in uh, 1941, we got back to uh, Fort Knox on uh, Saturday night, and Pearl Harbor was bombed the next day. So, uh, my <coughs> force panic. I just tossed my barracks bag on my bed, caught the train to Dawson Springs as soon as we got into, into Fort Knox. And uh, got over here to the E.P. Hughes bus station Sunday morning and uh, found out that uh, Pearl Harbor had been bombed. And there I was, AWOL from and time of war. And, and uh, fortunately, there was much excitement when I got back to Fort Knox. They, they hadn't missed me, so I, I came out and I was kidding. <laughs> anyway, we uh, we were one of the primary trained divisions of the Army, and uh, Germany was threatening to uh, come across the channel from uh, France into England, and uh, take over the British Isles, and uh, uh, they moved our first armored division into Northern Ireland as a protection against uh, Hitler invading the British Isles. We were in uh, North, Northern Ireland and uh, England for about six months. I was a radio operator, and I had to learn to talk and understand the British, and uh, they didn't uh, use the same words as we did. For a truck, they called it a lorry, <coughs> and they put petrol in it instead of gasoline. The uh, back end of an automobile was called a boot, and the elevator up to the second floor was called a lift, but uh, after about six months of uh, jawing with the British, well, I could, I could get by. So we, we were there in Ireland and, and England for about six months, and uh, till the invasion of uh, North Africa, and uh, we, we went in the second wave of, uh, of uh, <coughs> invasion that when uh, they invaded North Africa. Uh, we, we went in at Tunis and uh, this was uh, from uh, November until February. We were in battle off and on from all the time up to uh, Tunis, well, and uh, that's where the uh, we ran into Rommel and his people had been they'd been fighting for three years and knew the ins and outs of war that we we were very fresh at it and uh, they, we took a licking. And as I said, we lost 150 tanks and uh, 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 approximately 5,000 were killed or captured. And uh, uh, we uh, were kept in a schoolhouse in Tunis 
and uh, we would walk across from Tunis, across Tunis to the airport, seven miles across there, and uh, the, uh, they were having to put us on transport planes, and uh, we'd get out there and sit all day in no plane and walk, walk back. And they'd take us back a different street every, every time to show us off to the civilian population, give them a chance to spit on us. And uh, the third time of going across uh, to, this, to the airport, uh, got on an airplane and flew over to uh, Palermo, Sicily. We uh, landed here at, at Palermo, and uh, the Americans and uh, British were getting ready to invade Sicily. So they they were, were, were just about bombing it day and night. The Americans bombing daytime and the British bombing at night. And uh, very little chance to get any rest. And uh, we were in a schoolhouse uh, in the, right in the middle of uh, Palermo. And uh, bombs hitting the civilians, and uh, there were dead Italians out in the street there, and they found out that we were American prisoners and tried to storm the place, and fortunately we were protected by the German guards and <coughs> kept them, kept them <coughs> doing us some damage. <coughs> they put us into uh, railroad cars. You may have heard 40 and 8. Well, uh, I think the eight horses had just been taken out of the boxcar. They uh, took us up through, through Italy and the Brenner, Brenner Pass in the dead of winter. It was very cold. And we were six days from, from uh, Italy up into Germany. And uh, our first stop in Germany was uh, at uh, Duisburg outside of uh, Munich. That's now like 7A. And uh, there we were photographed and fingerprinted. And uh, the Red Cross was notified that we were prisoners of war. And the Red Cross there to, in turn notified our families. Uh, the family last <coughs> they had heard was I was missing in action back in uh, March, and this was in August when they got the notice that I was prisoner of war. So they found out that I was still kicking, but not very high. And uh, we, we were there about. Uh, Two weeks for uh, process and uh, reported as prisoners of war. Back into the railroad car, and another six days a, a train load of prisoners of war takes a very low priority in the, in the, uh, on the railroad. And uh, they were having to ship ammunition and supplies to the their army in, in Italy, so our trade spent a lot of time on the, on the side tracks, letting the uh, priority trains go, go by. So we made it up to Stalag 3B, and that was home for almost two years. And uh, the uh, Russian army was coming in from uh, from the east, and uh, the Germans didn't want us to be liberated. They wanted to hold on to us for a bargaining chip. And so they started us out walking the 31st day of December in uh, 1944. 
eight inches of snow below zero, and this was 120 mile march, and it took us six days to uh, make that. We make about 12 miles a day, so we, we made that 120 miles in six days, and got to uh, a different prison camp, LA 3A. And uh, we got there in February, and uh, uh, the 22nd day of April, the Russians caught up with us, and they liberated the prison camp. And, uh, well, it's just a change of captors. The, the Russians treated us worse than the Germans did. They, they did, didn't treat us as well, and, and brought our beef in on the hoof. We had to slaughter, milk the old cow before we slaughtered. But uh, we had to do our own slaughter, food preparation. And uh, I, I was a radio operator and I'd taken over a couple of uh, radios that the Germans had left in there. Found out that uh, the Americans and Russians had met at the uh, Elm River, and uh, we went to there too, and uh, I got uh, 12 of my friends together, and uh, we started out walking to Wittenberg, and uh, the German civilians were completely terrified of the Russian army, and they were overjoyed to have an American soldier come in and spend the night in their home just to protect them from the, from the, from the Russians. And uh, we were out for three, three days and nights up, getting up to the Up River, and uh, we met up with a, uh, well, we got the Up River, and Russians wouldn't take it, let us get across. There had been an agreement between uh, President Roosevelt and uh, Stalin that uh, every live body that the Russians brought back across the Elbe River, they would be paid a $25 ransom. And uh, I slipped across and I ignored it. I still owe $25. <laughs> we met up with an American general with a convoy of GI trucks, and he loaded us on and uh, took us over to uh, Hildesheim Airport. And uh, this is the Hildesheim Airport. And there we were cleaned up and fed got the lice off of us and uh, did a pretty decent meal and uh, put on airplanes and flew over to Reims, France and uh, put on hospital train there and taken it to uh, Camp Lucky Strike, the uh, rehabilitation center. And we were there about six weeks getting into uh, rehabilitation, uh, fed uh, bland diet because most of our stomachs are out of shape and uh, partial pay and uh, then uh, put on the boat six days coming across to uh, New York City and uh, Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. At Cap Atterbury, and then uh, 75 day furlough of Dawson Springs. I live to tell it. Thank you very much. Dudley, how many, how many uh, were there of you when you first got on the train, and, and, and how many died, and how many survived, and all that? There, there were about uh, 5,000 of the captured the same time I was during that three-day battle. Of, uh, and uh, 
we were all separated according to non-commissioned officers in one camp, officers in another, and privates put out on work detail. And it's hard to tell how many survived. The books that I have read, a lot of them didn't, didn't have it as good as, as I, I did. I, I was in a non-commissioned officer camp, and uh, we only had a couple of deaths there. And a couple of medical doctors came in and took, took care of our medical needs. And uh, you never know until you get home and count, count heads to see, see who survived, who didn't. Anyone else? In your meetings with other POWs since you've been involved with the with former POWs, how many of you met that were in the same camps that you were in? Very many. When uh, we were, we first started going to camps to pre reunions, uh, Ruth and I would uh, host a reunion of the three camps that I was in. 3B, 3A, and 7A. And uh, we'd get 45 to 50 sometimes when we were there. I didn't, didn't know all of them because they were at different times in, in different camps. And uh, it got to where nobody would show up. For, uh, let's face it, was, those people were getting old. <laughs> and Kitty was lucky enough to be at at least two of our reunions, one in Boulder Green and one in uh, uh, Pitrow Park. You didn't make it to Louisville, did you? No, sir, I don't think so. We, we had the National Convention in, in Louisville, and uh, we had uh, a thousand or so at, at the National Convention, but uh, what is your age now, Dudley? Now, yeah, ninety-one. Be, be ninety-two in August. Dudley had invited uh, myself. If you remember, and maybe you don't, we were doing a program. We did about eight highlights which was, and then some cabarets after that. And myself and Tracy and Tracy McKnight and Cindy Franklin Bratcher did a uh, trio of, of uh, patriotic tunes. And it was part of what we did uh, back in that program. Partially, we did some other things too. But they had asked us to come and put that program and then maybe a little more patriotic tunes together. So we did for those two occasions. They got paid. I gave them a silver dollar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you wrote a book about your adventures, didn't you? Did it? Oh yeah. I, no, I didn't bring mine. It's, uh, it's available on Amazon, I think. <laughs> I don't have any more for sale. <coughs> well, we thank you for sharing that with us. It's a story that needs to be told. There's not enough people left anymore to tell it. It's very much longer. And it's uh, there's not enough of it in, in the history books to Give a straight story. 